Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first Authors and Artists series event by Illuminations. Uh, my name is Daphne Lei. Uh, I'm the director of Illuminations Chancellor's Arts and Culture Initiative. Today, I have the pleasure and honor to welcome our guest, um, Rachel Kushner. Uh, but before we start, I want to thank, first of all, uh, Professor Julia Lupton for <laughs> collaborating with us and inviting her. Uh, and Professor uh, Lupton is the uh, former uh, director of Illumination, so I learned a lot from her. And I also want to thank um, Professor Karamet Reiter, uh, who is going to introduce uh, um, Rachel Kushner today. And Professor Reiter is a professor from uh, criminology, law, and society. And some of you are her students. They were there in the class today, this morning? Yes. Okay, go get another cookie. You get extra <laughs> point. <laughs> okay, so yeah. So, yeah. Please. Thanks. So I'm really excited to welcome Rachel Kushner to give this talk today. I study prisons and incarceration, and so I've been a big fan of hers for a long time, reading Mars Room, which was a bestseller, and also her profile in the New York Times magazine of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and some of my students read some of those for this week, and we had the honor of having a conversation with her this afternoon in my class. And I have to say, I have always admired her incredibly vivid, realistic storytelling, and it was so amazing to hear her describe uh, some of the experiences she had that led to her ability to tell these incredibly vivid stories. So I'm so excited to hear her read some of her other work that's not about prison tonight. And then I think we're going to welcome a Q&A after that. So be thinking, I can, I can say from this afternoon, she was just wonderful in responding to questions. So I hope you're, you'll all be thinking of what you want to ask her as she reads. And I could go on about all her accolades, writing for the New York Times Magazine, um, uh, for the Paris Review, for Harper's and, and many book awards, but I think I would just like to turn it over to her to speak to us. So thank you so much for being here. Hi. Um, thank you, Daphne. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Karamet. It's, um, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for coming. I um, <clears throat> grab my water. I was, are some of you guys undergrads? Or uns undergrads here, right? Yeah. I uh, was educated myself in the UC system, and so it really does, it's corny, but it gives me um, special pleasure to come to UC school. Um, when I went to a UC school, there actually, technically, from what I understand, was no tuition. We just paid like facilities fees and um, registration fees, registrar's fees, and like an athletics fee and health insurance fee. And I remember my first semester, it was $585. <laughs> and I paid for it myself out of my summer job. Um, I know that it's not like that anymore. That said, I still feel, and this is the corny part, incredibly proud to live in a state that has done some things wrong <laughs> Some things right, but the UC system and the state school system, I feel like is, those are the real like capstones of the state and the uh, mission to educate the populace of the state in state universities is something I totally believe in and I'm, for better or worse, a product of that system myself. So, for better is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, so it's cool to be at a UC school anyway. Some people just left. I, they, that was like enough. <laughs> um, no, they just opened the door. I was kidding. Um, all right, I, uh, I'm going to read um, a, a short story that um, was uh, in the New Yorker this summer in the fiction issue, July. And it's also online. Um, and the reason I mention that is only because it's quite a long story, so we're going to be here for 180 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm not going to read the whole story. I went through and I've kind of abbreviated it a bit. Uh, I think that the integrity of the story remains, but if you want to read the longer version, uh, it is available online. It's called 
a king alone and what else about it? Oh, the part I cut out um, actually pertains to a guy that my character gives a ride to who is a photographer. And um, it was inspired by the photographer William Eggleston. So they put this really cool Eggleston photograph um, with the story when it ran in the print issue of The New Yorker. And then um, William Eggleston saw it and decided to put it in his catalog. So it's now in this book of photographs of Eggleston photos. But that part's not in what I'm going to read. This is just, um, had to keep it shorter anyway. And then I'm happy to take questions after. <clears throat> a king alone. I feel like this is a safe in front of me or something. It's weird. Okay. He was on a low road next to the French broad, which divided the town in half. He thought about how with small cities like this one that were split in two by a river, you added the word west or the word east to the half that was less desirable the half that was not the commercial center. He had been on this road before, 20 years earlier. The damp and teeming feel was familiar and unchanged. There was almost no development here, just tall trees and railroad tracks. His windows were down and the river felt close as if its green water were breathing on his skin. He arrived at the railroad crossing. He remembered this crossing as the gates were descending. He waited. The sound of a train horn blasted into the car. As the train appeared and rumbled past, industrial Norfolk Southern, tankers of chemicals connected one to the next like hot dog links, a man hobbled up to the driver's side window. Where had he come from? Who knew? People seemed to pop up on a roadside from out of nowhere. The man's mouth moved as though his lips were dancers. George heard nothing at all. The, the train was moving past, tanker by tanker, and the sound of it drowned out every other. The man kept talking. His chin was stubbled in gray, his gut sloping forward like a stretched water balloon. He was on crutches, missing the bottom half of one leg. He held the crutches and also a full bottle of beer, as if this were no challenge. The man and George were possibly the same age. People aged differently. George was 60, but felt undeterred in his habits and pursuits. He had both his legs for starters. George pointed to his ears and shook his head to indicate that he couldn't hear the man's words, and the man nodded and stopped moving his lips. The two of them, George in his car, the man resting his armpits on the supports of his crutches, watched the train slide past like they were watching a movie. When the caboose appeared, orangey-red, some things, not that many, do not change, the man spoke again. Can you take me to the other side of the river? Just up to River Bar. It's close. George said that was fine. He had always picked people up. It was like they knew. They understood that they could just walk up to his car window at a stoplight, crutch up to the window. The man was impressively nimble, getting in the car with the crutches and the missing half leg and his beer bottle, as though he'd been managing this way for some time. The gates went up. As they set off, the man raised his beer bottle in a toast, the turbulence of the uneven train tracks sloshing beer onto the car seat. George did not care, had never cared about anything material, and certainly not this Ford Crown Victoria, which looked like an undercover cop car. Did you know most people are dehydrated, the man said. 90% of Americans is what I read. All these thirsty people, not me. He drained the beer bottle. George did not ask the man what had happened to his leg. He sensed that he would hear about it without prompting. A very long train was stopped on the tracks one afternoon, the man told George. He was walking. He had always walked to River Bar before the accident. He waited and waited for the train to move so he could cross. There was no engineer, no one in sight, and happy hour at River Bar was almost over. You get a shot at a beer for three dollars, he said. He had six bucks and he could get a little credit from Smitty, the bartender who was working that night. He figured he'd step over the linkage between train cars, do it quickly. Why stand there getting eaten alive by tiger mosquitoes when he could be inside under a fan, drinking with his buddies? 
He got one leg up over the linkage when the train lurched forward and started rolling. It picked up speed, with him trapped under it. He detailed to George what had happened next. There was a tourniquet fashioned from a shirt, a nephew of Smitty's who worked in the emergency room, a sum he was awarded eventually thanks to a lawyer from Charlotte, an ex-wife who bled him of the money as if he had a hollow leg, and look, he said, I don't have any leg. He had told this story, the bar, the train, the shirt, the lawyer, the ex-wife, the hollow leg, probably 800 times. River Bar was a shack painted sky blue with a dark open doorway. It looked like the kind of outbuilding where you'd expect to find old gas cans and a lawnmower. There were voices audible from inside, people relaxing and drinking in this tiny shed. The man thanked George for the ride and got out of the car and started crutching. At the entrance, he shouted, Honey, I'm home. Honey, I'm home. It was like in that movie with Jack Nicholson, pretending he's a cheerful 1950s style husband when really he's a monster and a murderer. But maybe that was a 1950s husband, George considered. That movie, The Shining, only pretended to be horror. It was really the horror of your typical family, men yelling and blaming, and women on their eggshells padding around. He'd heard this line just a week earlier. It was as if there were a regional conspiracy of men yelling, honey, I'm home. It had happened at a liquor store near the Bass Lake in North Florida where George had gone to fish. He was buying bait. At the counter was a display of fireball on military discount. The clerks were from India and they were behind bulletproof glass because the place had been held up repeatedly. This was on the Georgia border near a huge state mental hospital. Some character walked in and grabbed a bottle of Fireball and yelled, Honey, I'm home. The two clerks did not look up at him. Honey, I'm home, but what's the use? Honey, I'm home, but I can't stay long. George had been in a dry spell, lyrics-wise. He turned that one over, hoping something might come from it, as he meandered north. A giant insect flew into the car and got trapped in an air vent on his dashboard. He pulled over to direct the insect out, but mangled it by accident while trying to remove it from the vent with the edge of his insurance card. It left a mess suited for one of those cleanup companies, the ones that come in after a flood or a suicide or a chemical spill. Not that he'd ever called one. Cleanup man, that was a concept for a song. The guy who sidles in with a woman as she's exiting a long and brutal marriage as she's ending a short and volatile affair. Whatever it was, something complicated, the cleanup man came after. He's not the one, I ain't the one. That was a Leonard Skinner song. The cleanup man is the guy she cries to. He's an innocent, he's not to blame. George took a few notes in his little black leather bound notebook, which he kept on the car seat for when he had a sudden idea. He turned up a leafy incline where he expected to see a diner on the right, a place he'd gone to with his daughter, Jenny, 20 years ago when he was in this town to visit her. He could go there again. Jenny did not live here anymore, but she'd love that diner. And when he got to Nashville, where he was going in order to see her, he could tell her that he'd gone back to the diner. It was on a rise above the river, as he'd remembered, but it was almost completely covered in kudzu, which looked to be pulling down the nearby electric lines. The place was wrecked and abandoned. Its name had been Greek Diner. At least that was what Jenny had called it. That can't be the name, George had said. She'd pointed to the sign. It's like Chinese buffet, he'd said, or Thai food. It's not called that, that's just what it offers. But the place had lost the sign indicating what its name was long ago, and people called it Greek Diner. The woman who ran Greek Diner had decorated the place with her own folk art, postcards and calendar pages collaged with bird appliques, Disney characters, and Bible verses, and coated with a hard, shiny lacquer. The woman had had a mysterious accent, Greek maybe. She wore stage-ready makeup and, big and a big brown wig with height, structure, and large bore curls as if she were Loretta Lynn. She seemed lacquered like her folk art, existing in a different reality from the one that Jenny and George occupied, and not just because she was shit-faced drunk, slurring and stumbling between the vinyl booths at Greek Diner. There was a genuine mystery to her. Isn't she gorgeous, Jenny had said. 
George and Jenny, they liked the same kinds of things. Jenny had meant, isn't she wild? And he had agreed that she was. Back then, Jenny had been living in an unfurnished little house next to a creek in West Asheville. There were people along that creek who were off the grid, using generators and rain cisterns. They weren't hippies. They were country people, suspicious of the government. Several times that week, while George was staying with Jenny, he had woken up to the sound of arguments, people threatening to blow each other's heads off. He remembered Jenny's neighbor, a character named Junior Brown, who had no idea he shared a name with a musician in Austin, where George lived now and for whom George had written a couple of songs. Junior Brown painted cars for a living, and the fumes had ravaged him. He talked a lot about Mr. Smith and Miss Wesson, the two accomplices that others might have to meet if they didn't stay in line. Junior Brown liked Jenny and said that if anyone messed with her, they'd have to talk to Mr. Smith and Miss Wesson. People with guns could be pretty corny about them. George himself did not own guns. He'd had a shotgun when he lived in the hill country outside Austin for shooting rabbits that got into his vegetable patch, but that was it. No handguns, nothing for so-called security. He thought of a possible song lyric, no gun in my pocket, I'm just happy to see you, or I'm just happy to see you, suggesting the other part, not stating it. Jenny had been employed then as a waiter at a place downtown by the courthouse in Asheville. Jenny said waiter, not waitress. She was a tomboy. She wore engineer's boots, Carhartt work pants, and wife beaters, had slicked back, chin-length hair, basically the same clothes and hair as George. She had no car. She walked into town to earn her pay. She was a songwriter like George, but not yet successful. She was a kid then, 21 or 22 years old. She'd eventually bought a car, an orange maverick that constantly broke down. Her joke to George was, catfish at a caviar price, because the used car lot on Patton Avenue where she'd bought her maverick had the reverse on its rippling banner, caviar at a catfish price. Ginny had learned to work on the car. She was like George in that way, in so many ways. She acquired tools and figured things out. George had come to visit only the one time. That week, they'd walked up the hill bordering the creek to the gas station for coffee each morning. They would dabbled in variability by trying different flavored creamers. They'd brought home a carton of milk and a package of Oreos for breakfast, dipped the cookies in the milk. Health food was for other people. Ginny had inherited his trim physique and his good looks, his bad food habits, almost an ethic, a way to keep things simple by knowing how to enjoy what was readily available at any gas station in America. The neighbor Junior Brown had told George that Ginny had a lot of good looking friends. I mean fine young ladies. Ouch, hurts me to look at them. They come and go. It's busy over there. George understood that Junior Brown was suggesting that Ginny had girlfriends, that she impressed him as a peer, an honorary man, which she was to George as well, except that she was also his daughter, and she didn't share her private life with him. He never asked her about it. They talked about their work, about music. The house in West Asheville that Ginny was renting had an old lawn jockey out front that Ginny could have sold to the antique mall downtown for good money. Instead, She'd wanted to take it out of circulation, her expression, as if it were money, because it was a racist curio and she didn't think people should be collecting them. George had helped her knock it from its anchored perch in a block of cement. They had carried the lawn jockey to George's car by the head and the feet like it was a corpse. It was solid concrete and weighed about 150 pounds. Part of its face had flaked away. It stayed in the trunk of George's car, putting an extra load on his rear shocks and springs until he found someone who wanted it, a blues musician in Mississippi. The last time he'd visited Ginny in Nashville, the only time, he'd been coming from the West. As he left Memphis, it was raining heavily. The roadways were flooded with water and debris. Wind was uprooting huge trees. It was too dangerous to keep going. He'd pulled off in a tiny town near the Kentucky border, the bar, a one bar, one motel. The motel had been full. He went to the bar. He met a woman there who had a tough sexiness and made a good drinking partner. 
He told her the motel was full and she said he could sleep at her place, an apartment down the street above a furniture store. He was due at Jenny's, but it was raining and he was following the script of chance, as he often did. He and the woman had not even kissed. He didn't know if they were going to. He never made assumptions about women and this sometimes got him in trouble when she asked him to burn her with her cigarette, which she held out to him. He told her there'd been a misunderstanding. He slept in his car that night, the wind angrily rocking it on its springs. Later, he regretted having been abrupt with the woman. She had tried to backpedal the request. He'd left anyway. I ain't the one. That was five years ago. That same night in that little bar, he danced with a much older woman. She was 70, she told him, to provoke his shock and his compliments. From the neck down, in the very tight pants and high heels she had on, she had the body of a 20-year-old. George remembered the song they danced to. It was, Love Between a Boy and Girl Can Be So Wonderful by the Tempries. The Tempries lead singer had a falsetto that was like velvety crushed ice. The voice was so beautiful that tears had run down George's face as he danced with this old woman in her tight pants and her high heels. Ginny was now more successful as a songwriter than George was. That was fine with him. He was proud of her. For himself, he never wanted anything out of reach. He never forced things. He went where doors opened, where he was invited, and that was it except that he had not been invited to visit her in Nashville, had not let her know that he was coming. She had stopped returning George's calls after that last visit five years ago. <clears throat> she did not answer his letters or his emails. He tried not to take this personally. She was living in the present, doing whatever she was doing. He was like that too. He figured he'd just show up and everything would be fine. It might not be fine, but he hoped it would be. She could take him to whatever was the equivalent of Greek diner in her world these days, and he could report that Greek diner was nothing but a memory, a collapsed building with a wig of kudzu fitted over it. He could get to work helping her with some project, refinishing furniture or replacing ball joints, putting lawn jockeys in trunks. That was how they visited. That was how they were. So, <clears throat> skipping ahead. <clears throat> When he'd arrived at Jenny's place in Nashville five years earlier, after the awkward confrontation at the woman's apartment and sleeping in his car, he'd been a day late. He'd explained that he'd been delayed because of the storm. He himself never cared if people were late, even several days late. He worked with musicians. They lived on their own time. He figured Jenny was the same. He told her about the old woman in her tight pants at the bar because it was a funny story and about the young woman who'd kicked him out when he didn't want to burn her with cigarettes because it was a strange story. She hadn't kicked him out so bluntly. It was more like she'd ruined the hospitality, but he was simplifying for Jenny. He thought Jenny would enjoy his reports from the road, but Jenny said she didn't want to hear about it. I don't need this, she said. It's bullshit. I try to let you into my life, which is something you haven't earned, and I'm sitting here waiting for you all night while well, you're apparently at some dive bar dancing with strangers. I've done a lot worse things with strangers than dance, George said, and smiled, hoping he could get her to lighten up. He and Ginny, they were cut from the same cloth. The two of them were ramblers and chroniclers, people who tried to condense things, complicated and painful things, into verse and chorus, something like that. But Ginny didn't laugh. Instead, she went into the kitchen and took a hammer from a drawer she walked outside and swung it into George's windshield, which fractured where she'd hit it in a large radiating web on the passenger side. She certainly knew how to use a hammer. That won't even hurt you, she said, because you don't give a shit about anything. He knew to stay quiet. She went back in. I skipped a whole part about how he didn't raise her. He left when she was a baby. <clears throat> he followed. They sat down and she started talking. She told him that for years she'd wondered when he would decide to get to know her, but the moment never arrived. She started talking about her childhood. Her mother had worked full time as a secretary at a wholesale farm equipment supplier to support them. This was in Carbondale, where her mother had returned after Chicago, after George had left, when Jenny was still a baby. 
At 16, Jenny got a weekend job with the local utility. She rode in a van with a crew. She was the only girl. She was already a tomboy by that point. One afternoon, the crew decided to make her into a proper girl to show her that she was one. When she started going into the specifics of what had happened, George discovered that he could not listen, could not hear it. He stood up. Of course, leaving wasn't the right thing to do, but he had to. See, see, she screamed after him. I knew it. You have your stories and I have mine. I don't want to hear your stories, just like you don't want to hear mine. He left her apartment and drove that stupid car with its partially fractured windshield all the way to Austin. That was their last interaction. Back at home, he could have taped the windshield to be cheap and to preserve the damage as a kind of stubborn penance, but he eventually had it replaced. George meandered from Western North Carolina into Tennessee. He picked up no more strangers. Oh, sorry, I skipped this part. Oh, after the amputee. He ate barbecue alone. He thought about calling Jenny to let her know that he was coming, but if he did, she might say, don't come. He arrived in Nashville at 10 p.m. He knocked on the door of Jenny's house. He heard a baby crying. He felt confused. Was this the right place? He was sure that it was. His memories of this street, the dead grass, and the little walkway leading to a brick triplex, Jenny's the only door that faced the front, and of what had happened between him and Jenny were vivid, although he had tried to forget them. A woman answered, holding a newborn. A man stood behind her. They showed no reaction when he said Jenny's name. We've been here three years, they said, and we don't know your friend. George said, it's my daughter. And they looked at him, and he felt their judgment. He went to a bar where people were drunk and rowdy, and he remained separate and alien. He slept in a motel and the next morning drove around Nashville with this sense of vertigo, as if his daughter were lost out there. But she was not lost. She was a 40-year-old woman, and she was living her life. She could be anywhere. He left Nashville. He drove along the border with Kentucky, traveling west. It was the same route he'd taken when he'd stopped in that one bar town to shelter from the storm, but in the opposite direction. He went back to that town. Retracing his steps was a habit of his, a way to navigate his life. This time, there was vacancy in the only motel. He paid for a room. It was late afternoon. He walked down the street to the bar and ordered a beer. As he ordered, he wanted to ask the bartender about the young woman he'd met there. He remembered her name, Merle, because it was unusual. But he hesitated, thinking the bartender might know about Merle's tastes. She'd probably asked every guy in the bar to burn her with cigarettes. But then he went ahead. Does Merle still come in here? You don't know, the bartender asked, as he opened George's beer bottle. No. The bartender said that Merle was dead. She'd had an argument with a boyfriend, and he'd shot her. That man was in prison now. There were others at the bar. The old woman with the young body, she was among them. She was 75 now. She walked up to George and asked him to dance, but he was still absorbing the news about Merle. He wasn't in the mood to dance, he told her. She looked at him with pity. Do you remember me, George asked her, suddenly feeling that this mattered. Why would I remember you, the old woman said with disdain. Because I danced with you last time. I was in this bar five years ago. Five years ago? Honey, I'm in here every night. Five years ago? I can't even tell you who I danced with yesterday. <laughs> she laughed, pleased with herself, and motored off to dance alone, her drink in her hand, swiveling her knees back and forth to the rhythm of the song that had just come on. She was wearing white pedal pushers and had the tanned legs of a college tennis champion. The bartender came out from behind the bar and boogied with the old woman. He danced until his regulars started yelling at him to get back behind the bar. George left. It would be dark in a couple of hours. If he started now, he could make it to Memphis. He had already paid for the room in the motel, but it was $60 and it didn't matter. He needed to keep moving. He drove in a southwesterly direction. The dogwoods were in extravagant bloom. Great, clotted, white-branched specimens that glowed in the dusk all along the Cumberland River. He was in countryside that seemed to have more cemeteries than it did towns, more people dead than living. But wasn't it like that everywhere, more dead than living? 
He pictured the face of the waitress from Greek Diner, her thick makeup. In his mental image of her, her eyes were closed, as if she were lying in a casket. As dusk transitioned to dark, the temperature dropped 30 degrees. He put on AM radio to get a weather report. It turned out that he was driving into a freak storm. Rain speckled his windshield. It surged, falling like a curtain over the road. He thought of the kid on his hike. He, oh, sorry, I have to skip that part because I had skipped it. All right. The rain lightened and then turned to gravelly pellets of ice. It began to patter his windshield like the taps of someone trying to get his attention. It was hailing, and as he slowed a little, he spotted a person on the side of the road, walking in pants and a t-shirt, no jacket, with towering beech trees behind him. It was dark and 31 degrees on a remote highway, hail popping from the ground. As George passed, the man sent up an arm, waving at him to stop. George didn't want to step on the brakes. The road was freezing, and he knew he could slide. Instead, he let off the gas and slowed. By the time he came to a stop, he was several hundred yards up the road. The guy ran toward his car, soaking wet. He was youngish, tall, and very thin. He was shivering as he approached the car, a baseball cap pulled down over his ears. George lowered the passenger side window. I'm going west, he offered, thinking he'd be noncommittal. That's good, the man said in a frail voice, his body trembling with cold. It wasn't until they were back on the road, slush collecting in long sloppy piles along the wiper blades, that George sneaked a look at his passenger. He appeared undernourished in his baggy clothes and baseball cap, hunched in the seat. His upper arms were the same diameter as his wrists. He stared straight ahead, perfectly still, as if he needed to concentrate on the road in order to keep George's car moving along it. I'll turn the heat up, George said. The man didn't respond. George wasn't the type to push for conversation, although he would have liked a little talk to get his mind off Ginny and the way the couple with the baby had looked at him as they absorbed that he didn't know where his daughter was. A semi-truck went past, noisy and slow, in the opposite direction, its headlights scouring the car's interior. In the harsh, bleached light, the passenger reached up and snatched off his baseball cap. A tumble of dark hair flopped over the man's thin shoulders and down his back. He shook his hair out. It went all the way to his waist, and he turned toward George. George realized that this person in his car was not a man. It was a woman. She grinned at George in a way he could not interpret, and he felt suddenly quite afraid. Um, how are you guys doing? Should I, should I finish? OK. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. All right. <clears throat> Don't stop I know, that was kind of a, <laughs> but I realize it's a little long, so. Um, the hail finally let up. He made mention of this to his hitchhiker. Now that he understood she was a woman alone in an area that was only dark woods, he wanted her to talk to confirm that she was OK. This is crazy weather for May, he said. She didn't respond. I'm going to Memphis, he said. I can let you out there. That all right? She nodded enthusiastically, like a mime accentuating emotion to compensate for muteness. You kind of appeared out of nowhere, he said. Her mouth quaked into that same smile from before, almost maniacal. Nowhere, she said, as if impressed by the word. And she started to laugh, an eruption of giggles. George stared ahead. He reminded himself how frail she looked. There was nothing to be afraid of, he told himself. Have you eaten, he asked. We could stop and get something. I can't remember, she said. No, I had a hamburger, but I don't know when that was. It could have been a week ago. <laughs> she giggled in a machine-like way that had no joy in it. He said they could stop if they found something up ahead. He hadn't eaten either, and it would be a break from having to be alone with her in his car. Thirty minutes later, there was a restaurant on the side of the road, a country place with a few customers brightly lit. George pulled over. Seated across from her, he could see that she had smears of dirt or soot on her face, which she partly hid behind her long, straight brown hair. She had deep scratches on her arms. He did not like the way the scratches looked, and he let himself wish he could get rid of her. He asked where she'd come from, and she said, 
I've been in a few places, some different places. He tried to press her. I was walking, she said. Then you pulled over. Where are you trying to go? He asked. You can take me to Memphis, she said. That's where you said you're going. But where will you go from there? That depends, she said. Where's home for you? George didn't like the way this was becoming an interrogation. He, the interrogator. She looked at the table, folding her bony hands one over the other, her fingernails lined with dirt. I'm in between places right now, she said. I'm going to see some friends of mine, people who know me. The waitress came. George ordered spaghetti and meatballs and a beer. He needed the beer. The woman glanced at the menu with a worried look. She seemed unable to parse it. Spaghetti and beer, she said. You want the same as him, hon? She nodded adamantly in her mime style. She ate like an animal. George tried not to stare. She picked up each meatball like it was an apple and took quick bites and then set it back on the plate. She picked it up again and bared her teeth and bit at it as if she were punishing it. Death by a thousand bites. She sipped the beer, made a face of displeasure, and then she dubbed salt into it from a shaker on the table, which agitated the beer, sent it foaming up in its glass. She picked up the foaming beer and guzzled, leaving a white mustache over her mouth. She stared at George with beer and spaghetti sauce on her face. They were back in the car. It had stopped sleeting. After two hours of driving, they arrived in Memphis. It was late, almost midnight. Where should I let you off, he asked. Anywhere's fine, she replied. He took the business loop off the freeway and pulled up to an intersection to let her out. I'll drop you here, he said. She got out. He said goodbye and wished her luck. Thanks, she said, and walked off, her gait stiff and hurried, a half run. It was how she'd moved when he'd pulled over for her, when he'd thought she was a man. He was planning to stay in a motel he knew, the Admiral Benbow, which was on the main drag, but it was apparently no longer, closed down, its sign dark. There was a series of large chain hotels all in a row further on. He chose one, got a room, closed the curtains and locked the door. The next morning, he woke to the sound of vacuuming in the room next to his. It was late. He had slept a long time. He made coffee in the little carafe in his room and let himself rouse slowly, flipping channels on the television. Walking toward his car, he saw that the woman was there, waiting for him. A wave of panic went through him. He tried to calm it. She must have searched every hotel lot on this boulevard. She stood. I'm ready, she said. He was caught off guard. He didn't have a lie prepared. I'm going to visit some friends, he said. OK, she said. But she continued to stand there next to his car, looking down, her skeleton arms folded over her chest. He felt something in him give. They live in Arkansas, he said. This gave him some out, he felt. He was going all the way to Austin, but he could get rid of her sometime today in Arkansas, wherever he claimed he was going. They set off. Again, she said almost nothing. The woman impulsively pressed play on his car stereo. Born to be wild came on. It was his cassette of Steppenwolf. The woman reached and turned up the volume. They rode with Born to be wild blaring into the car. God playing a joke, Born to be wild. He had a woman in his car he could not shake. He didn't know if she was mentally unstable or shell-shocked or had some other problem. Over the course of the day, he tried a few more times to have normal interactions with her. When they stopped to get gas, she went into the women's room around the back of the station, and he contemplated starting the car and taking off before she returned. He could not bring himself to do it. She appeared from behind the gas station. I thought you were going to leave, she said. That was the thing about crazy people. Everything goes out of whack except their ability to read other people's minds. They crossed Arkansas, and George couldn't drum up the nerve to tell her that this was it. The fictitious friends came and went. They were in Texas now, heading toward Dallas. This is where I'm going, he said. I can drop you off, OK? She nodded her mime's nod, as if, yes, Dallas, sure. Do you have money, he asked her. I don't need money, she said. I mean, I had some. I'll have some again. I find it when I need it. He reached into his wallet and pulled out $40, which was what he had. Here, take this. She looked at it on the seat. Please take it, he said. She picked up the bills. 
They were now on one of those hideous eight-lane boulevards with car dealerships and chain restaurants. He pulled over near a gas station and a McDonald's. Good luck with everything, he said. Okay, she said. She thrust her hand out for him to shake. He paused because he hadn't expected it, and she retracted her hand and got out. She walked away with the same stiff, brisk gait, the baseball cap, her hair down in her baggy t-shirt and loose pants. She turned toward the McDonald's and went rushing through its entrance as if it were the gateway of a predetermined journey she was on. He saw the $40 he had tried to give her was on the passenger side floor. He picked up the bills and got out, went into the McDonald's thinking he'd give her the money. He didn't see her inside. He walked up to the counter. Did you see a woman with long hair come in here just now, tall and thin with a baseball cap? He asked the cashier. I think I saw who you mean, the cashier said. She left, but I didn't see her come out. She went out the other door, the cashier said. Customers aren't supposed to use that. It's an emergency exit. He walked back outside and circled the McDonald's on foot. He didn't see the woman. He watched cars blow past on this ugly boulevard. A man in an overcoat carefully picked trash from the garbage can outside the McDonald's. Why were these hobo types always in overcoats? SUVs idled at the drive through window. A man in a parked car lowered his window and offered his leftovers to the man sorting trash. The man rushed over, coattails flapping, to receive the offering. God bless, he said. Night was coming on. The boulevard didn't have sidewalks. It wasn't for people on foot. George realized that he could not guess what age the woman was, maybe 30, maybe older. He asked the man in the overcoat if he'd seen a woman with long hair wandering around. She got out of your car, the man said. That's right, George said. I think she went that way, he pointed up the boulevard. Are you sure, George asked, aware that he might sound desperate. At a huge intersection up where the man had pointed was an auto zone. George went in and asked about the woman, if anyone had seen her. The other businesses here were closed for the night. The clerk said he hadn't seen anyone who fit that description. It was dark now, the high sodium lamps on the boulevard glowing orange, blotting out the sky, and making the nimbus from their artificial light feel like a world, but a mean and impersonal one. A truck missing its muffler went tearing past. George walked back to his car. Maybe she'll be there, he thought, like at the motel in Memphis, waiting like a dog. Some cats are like that too. He'd once had a cat, a petite black thing that looked like a kitten, though it was grown, that would follow him all around, even two blocks down to his coffee shop in Austin, wait outside as he ordered, and saunter home at some distance, but never too much distance, and then flop down on his stoop. The woman was not at his car. He went into the McDonald's a second time. Did she come back in here? He asked the cashier. Who? The woman I was asking about earlier with the long hair. Oh, no, I don't think so. He was suddenly envious of that cashier who wasn't looking for someone, who was just doing her job without having to manage a feeling of loss or doubt. He got into his car and turned onto the boulevard, driving slowly, keeping his eye on the parking lots of the businesses he passed. He went about a mile, then turned around to check the other side of the boulevard. He was circling the lot of a Dollar General when he thought he saw her. He pulled over, feeling a rush of adrenaline. But the figure who looked like her, tall and thin, was a woman with two children. They got into the car and drove off. People were parking in order to shop at Dollar General, getting out of their cars and walking toward the entrance. Others were leaving Dollar General, putting grocery bags in hatchbacks and driving away. He caught snippets of conversations, people doing normal things, being family members, making purchases. He was feeling the same envy he'd had for the cashier at McDonald's. These people did not know what he was dealing with. He tried to think of where to look next. He pulled out of the lot. He drove in the right lane with his blinker on going slow in case he spotted her. People honked at him. He didn't care. Go around me, he thought at them. He continued on, driving five miles an hour, alert to every person on foot and ready to stop. All right, that's it.
sorry to hold you all hostage for so long, but I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Yeah, I was thinking, thank you for asking that. I was actually thinking about it while I was reading the story. I mean, I was noticing that there's like a forlorn element to the disappearance of things that, for George, um, feel like home, since he's kind of forgotten the home of family. And I used real places that I know, because, you know, it's what writers do, and it's how you can have like a command of your subject and provide the sort of texture that's necessary to make the story come alive. Um, at the same time, I was noticing that later in the story, it's you know the Eight Lane Boulevard, and I can use references like McDonald's and AutoZone, and they could be anywhere. But then that the anywhere depersonalized, kind of alienating nature of those places is something oddly that we can share, writer to reader, and me as reader to writer, and so then we can write about those places, which somehow don't have, um, they aren't rooted in the local. I don't know if that answers your question. Any more questions? Please use the mic. Thank you for that reading. Very nice. What, what issue of the New Yorker can we find the full version in? Say it again. What issue of the New Yorker can we find? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, okay, so it was the fiction issue. Yeah. I think it was July seventh. July seventh. Okay. Yeah, and it's um, it's on the whole thing is online. Um, yeah, and I recorded it for them too. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the whole thing, which takes an hour to read, so I cut out like a third of it or sixty percent. Uh, I cut 40%, so hopefully that didn't take more than 40 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I wanted to ask uh, two questions. But they're motivated by um, my reading of the flamethrowers and, and telex to, to Cuba. So I, they're basically about your relationship to poetry and politics you know, as you put forth two books like this, which are very much invested in two distinct political times. Um, so it's more of a writerly question. Like, How sure. do you begin to think about you've gone too far, it might be agitprop or a point of view for a particular setting that is not the central you know, drama of the island or the Red Brigade, for example. Um, so that was one thing. Like, how, do you, how do you think through the relationship between politics as you're writing? And also, you're quite a wordsmith. Does poetry come naturally to you? Do you write poetry, or do you read it to get going? Or? Oh, gosh, thanks for that question. Thanks for reading those books. Um, I don't know if I can be equal to the question. Um, a, you know, it has a, um, a, it condenses things. Um, about the poetry, um, he, well, I, I, don't, I don't write poetry. Um, I started out writing poetry, but I think many writers do, maybe when they're younger, because it's just a sort of like first foray into experimenting with um, bending language. Actually, there's a whole part of the story that I skipped where George teaches in, the, in a job core program um, and starts kind of stealing the uh, wordsmithing style of the women that he's trying to teach math to, who are all there by court order, you know, and are just getting him to sign their probation things. And he realizes, like, oh, they're bending language like glassmakers. And, um, I think everyone has that moment, who later becomes a writer, of um, seeing that language has shortcuts and loopholes in it, and poetry is the, you know, kind of the beginning of that. Um, I, I didn't pursue poetry or study it, um, but I do like to, I do like to read um, poets for sure. I don't know. I mean, my first novel, I was really trying to figure out how to write a novel. I mean, it's all, you know those who um, embark on that journey are trying to do. And it wasn't um, the usual kind of first novel material, which isn't to say that there is a usual, but sometimes people write about their own life. And instead, you know, I was trying to write about um, this world that I had s seen the residues of. Like I went to Cuba 
um, with my mother and her sisters who had lived there when they were kids. And they'd lived in this very strange, like United Fruit colony. It was like colonial environment. And the residue of all of that was there. And United Fruit had painted all the houses this company color. And you know, Cuba, so poor, um, had not paint, repainted those houses since they had been occupied by the overseers of a colonial empire that owned you know, 95% of the arable land in eastern Cuba. And I was just kind of overwhelmed by the scene and this flaked paint. And so I think I start with an image. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a visual image. But to try to get at what I wanted to explore, I needed to kind of be able to shift tones easily. And um, there were certain writers you know, who kind of lead the way. Like, I don't know if I could have written that book without reading a lot of um, the writer. I, I never figured out how to pronounce his name correctly, but Alejo Carpentier, or Carpentier, who was? Carpentier. It's Carpentier, OK, because yeah, I didn't know if it was like a French pronunciation. It's confusing because he left Cuba and lived in Paris and like was friends with all the surrealists. And his novels have this kind of amazing density to them. And so I really studied his books, and especially uh, A Kingdom of This World, you know, about the Haitian Revolution, which is a kind of poem. It, you know, I don't know if you agree, if you know that book. So maybe to some degree that. And then I don't, I don't know about the flamethrowers. What, what the, I mean, in terms of politics, I don't really, f I don't, um, I'm interested in like, I mean, like Cuba has this like long, incredible his political history that's like a soap opera in, in many ways. And um, I was interested in like a novel that could maybe, maybe have something to say about this incredible moment of like national liberation movements the world over. And as a child of the 20th century, myself born in 1968, it seemed like an appropriate subject for me to move through. But I didn't come at it with a political, I mean, I do secretly have a point of view, but for arts, like I didn't come at it saying, oh, I am going to manipulate the reader so that they can come around to a particular perspective. It was more like, it's just all there. Like those parts can tell themselves without me telling them. Like I, I sort of leave that to um, the reader to some degree. But you know, it can be funny because people uh, who are very sentimental about the good old days in Cuba, you know, before the revolution, weren't offended by the book. And then other people thought it was completely on their side, which sort of it was. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what I, I don't know what to say about the politics because I, I feel like art has such a special place, at least for me, that it's doing something else than making an argument. We are over time already. Is it okay to take maybe one more question? Yeah, it's fine with me. Okay. <laughs> no one else is going to ask. This is self-serving. Uh, <laughs> but there was an article, and I, I don't remember where I read it, um, where you talked about having be begun a particular book by first reading another novel and breaking it down in terms of, I think I might be, I'm not sure if I'm right about this, in terms of understanding exactly how each character was introduced. Um, does that ring a bell? No. No. Okay. Are you sure it was me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a part of a writing workshop that she talks about a quote from you that says that. So. I don't know. I mean, I'd have to know which novel yeah, it was. Okay. You know, I mean, that's the funny thing about, it's like you write the novel, and um, it's really, you know, however you manage to pull it off, it's kind of like a deus ex machina. You know, like something swoops in at the last minute and the whole thing comes together. And then you go out and try to account for how you did it, and which isn't to say that you know anything I've said should not be taken seriously. <laughs> but something forms to replace the aporia of the not knowing of how you made the thing. You know what I mean? And, so, and then there's language there, and then it kind of hardens. And then you have a script that you use to just get through uh, you know, the, 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 the having written the book, writing it is so private. I mean, I just feel like it's like, it's the best thing in the world. It's just, it's so private. I never think about 
people reading the book or going on a tour with it or having to develop a discourse about it. Although weirdly with this story, when I was writing the story, I was hoping somebody would publish it because I wanted to um, talk about it just because it was like a really um, particular experience for me. So then I got to do that. There's a Q&A on the New Yorker website also. Do, do you think they all become like real people wandering in the world, your characters? <laughs> Uh, well, in the story, kind of, yeah. I mean, in, in, in so am I, far as... Am I running to them on the street? Well, I was going to say, good question, Daphne. Like, in so far as the world of the story is a sealed system, you know, like the transmission of a car, like the fluid just stays in it, it doesn't overlap or bleed into our world. But eternally, I feel this character, George, is in that space and looking for that woman who's sort of like a ghost who visits him to unsettle him deeply. I know when I see a guy driving like that, I'm going to think about George. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, I also have a self-serving question, I think, um, because I'm also from San Francisco. Oh, really? And I grew up there, yes. And I also, I think you went to a little high school. Just for one year. I and went for two it was years. It's so dumb that I transferred. It's like the one good school, and I, I, yeah, I was not happy there. And I also, anyway, I feel I ha we have a lot in common. Yeah. And, and I went to Washington after that. Oh uh, no, I, I, I dropped out, and then I went to UC Berkeley, and and I'm here for grad school. Anyway, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> when I read, so when I read the Mars Room, it occurred to me, um, for one thing, I feel like I know these people. Like they are the people I grew up around, a little bit later. And they're the people my parents spend time around. And it, it occurred to me when I was reading this, and I had never thought of it before, that like I've never read books about these people. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if you have, like if you if you think these stories about that like specific kind of, of lawless people and place already exist, or like where you found inspiration to write about these people, or what comes the closest, maybe. Like gosh, thanks for asking that. I love that question. Um, it's so validating. But uh, yeah, so with the Mars Room, um, that you know, they, like the character is. I was telling uh, briefly, uh, Kara Med students today, that you know the character is going to prison for life, and I knew that when I started the book, um, because I, I just needed to think about that process and what that feels like to ride that bus. I've thought of known a lot of people who've done that bus ride. It's like every Thursday they send 60 people from the um, receiving and release at the jail to Chowchilla. And I started with that. But then to really inhabit the voice of this character, I want to write in the first person. I often do. I think it's actually the hardest thing to do, um, the most challenging. And that was just the decision I'd made. But to do that, I needed to have the maneuverability um, and a depth to work with. And I resisted at first making this girl like from the Sunset District in San Francisco, which is where I grew up. Um, but then I was visiting home and talking to the people I grew up with who are all still very close to each other. Um, you know, kind of like no one left. I mean, they can't afford rent in San Francisco anymore, some of them, but it's still this very tight friend group of people and it's awkward to say, but like I'm the only writer. I'm the only one who went and did something kind of, you know, bookish. And it was always considered like an incredible weakness on my part, like, and a disloyalty to go to college. It just was not, there was like, it wasn't cool. There was no respect for it at all. But that's changed now, you know? And um, people said, like, you should write about our childhood. And then we started talking about it, and um, I, there was a person in our friend group who, very close friend, who uh, ended up going to prison. And it really determined the course of his life entirely, um, what happened with him. Because once inside, he became totally absorbed into the social structure inside the prison, and he was a natural leader in that structure and dedicated himself to that entirely and rose within it, you know, and he was like, you know, he's a gangster, and um, that's a crude way of putting it. He he was a leader in a world that doesn't that doesn't have any didn't have any external application, and you know he ended up just there for the long haul. And then when he finally got out, he died almost immediately. 
And um, it was talking to people from San Francisco where I sort of felt like if, um, if I don't write this book that's about this, you know, 20 square block of the city and the kids who grew up there and what it felt like for so many of them, then, it's, then no one, I mean, it just won't be in a book, which isn't to say that somebody else couldn't write it, but it's just specific to what I experienced. And, um, and then, you know, those who care to read books among that group all read it, and I felt like I wrote it for them and for us. Thanks for that. I wore everybody out, probably. All right, I think. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful evening.